We have a new technical trainee in the vestry this morning. Um, I'm not going to tell you who yet, in case things go horribly wrong and he feels embarrassed, but I'm very grateful to him and to Ian, now one of our established team who's doing some training. Um, and just to throw a curveball in, I thought we'd try something uh, new, a, a new and exciting thing that we can do with our new uh, uh, system which is to put up a slide during uh, the sermon so that you can hopefully see some notes uh, about the things that I'm saying as I'm saying them and hopefully uh, aid you in your uh, comprehension of what I'm saying so that you can then decide whether you agree or not with what I've said. Today is traditionally known as Passion Sunday. It marks the beginning of Passion Tide, which will of course culminate at the cross Passion Sunday brings Jesus' suffering to the fore, as I indicated in my introductory words to this service. It invites us to focus on the depth of meaning that suffering contains. But what does it mean? What is the significance of Christ's passion? Perhaps a story will help. Picture a scene. It's the Second World War and the Japanese army is forcing British prisoners to build a railway from Burma to China, crossing over the famous River Kwai. At the end of each day's labour in the sun, the prisoners are lined up and counted along with their shovels to make sure that none of those shovels can be used for escape attempts. But one day it's discovered that one shovel is missing. The Japanese soldiers scream their anger at the lined up prisoners. Unless you tell us now who has taken the shovel, you will all be shot, say the guards. For a moment there's stunned silence as each man comes to terms with the news that he might be about to die. Then one soldier steps forward from the line. It was me, governor, he says. I took the shovel. A Japanese soldier puts a gun to his head and shoots him dead on the spot. Later that day, the shovels are counted again and it's discovered that there's been a mistake. All the shovels are actually present and correct. There are no shovels missing at all. The soldier who apparently confessed his crime was in fact completely innocent. He took the punishment that had been threatened to all his brothers. He died so that they might live. And there, in what I'm told is a true story, we find an eloquently simple parable of what the death of Jesus has meant for many Christians over the centuries. The church has generally taught that Jesus took the punishment which should be ours. It's a theory known as the doctrine of penal substitution. In it, Jesus takes the punishment due to human beings who have ignited the righteous anger of God against humanity for its sin. It's the picture, or at least something like it, that I guess many of us have in our minds when we think about the death of Christ. But there are other ways of grappling with this idea. There are other ways of understanding the death of Jesus upon the cross. Most theologies of the cross rest on the idea of atonement, which is literally the, the idea of at one meant atonement. The idea that by his death, Jesus managed to bring fallen, sinful humanity to oneness with God. Many different images are used in pursuit of this idea, drawing from Isaiah's visions of the suffering servant. Theologians have proclaimed that it is by his wounds that we are healed. In other words, through suffering, Jesus atones for us. It is as if Jesus says sorry for us on our behalf to a wrathful God and then makes amends by choosing to suffer. His atonement is a substitute for the atonement we ourselves ought to offer. 
which is why this theory is called substitutionary atonement. Do you see? Substituting our atonement that should be with Jesus's atonement as was. Another theory is the idea of ransom. According to this theory, our sins make us the moral property of the devil. Because we sin, the theory goes, we belong to Satan, whom Jesus has described as the ruler of this world in today's gospel reading. Jesus, as the only sinless human being who has ever lived, was the only price that could be paid to, as it were, redeem us, pay for us, back from the devil. This is what the hymn writer Fanny Crosby was referring to in the second verse of our opening hymn in that line, O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. The purchase of blood, it's paying a ransom, a purchase for our souls. Fanny Crosby was clearly drawn to the idea that only with his blood could Jesus purchase our souls back from the devil and by doing so defeat him. And then, as Jesus is quoted in today's gospel, drive him out. But we need to remember that all these images are just that. They are images deployed by theologians like St Paul and many after him to try to get a handle on precisely what Jesus was doing that day, what it, this business on the cross that he was transacting with God and humanity really meant. And the reason why theologians still ponder and question it is because, frankly, Jesus himself never really explained how his death dealt with the problem of human sin. He never got into the mechanism of what it's all about. He, he didn't precisely define how his death obtains the forgiveness of our sin. So other theologians have shied away from images of punishment, of uh, substitution and of ransom. Many have struggled with the idea of Satan having so much power over creation that uh, sh uh, an omnipotent God who created all things, even created Satan himself, uh, should have to die in order to regain control from Satan. Surely, such theologians have said, if God is all-powerful, as the Bible declares and proclaims, he could just click his fingers and take care of Satan assuming Satan really exists at all. Other thinkers have wondered what it says about God to suggest that he insists on a universal cosmic punishment for all sin, which can only be paid by his own son. The Baptist minister, Steve Chalk, gained a bit of notoriety a few years ago when he suggested that this idea was a form of cosmic child abuse. Surely, goes the argument, a God who defines himself as merciful love can choose to pour out his amazing grace without requiring first some mechanism of torture and punishment. Such theologians, amongst which I dare to count myself, have wondered whether something else was really going on on the cross. Rather than Jesus paying a price for our sins to the devil or to a wrathful God, perhaps Jesus' death was instead God's message to the world. Not a purchase of blood or a price to be paid, but a monumental, unmissable, unforgettable sign which would be imprinted on all of humanity's hearts throughout history. What did that sign say? Well, drawing from the thinking of people like Rowan Williams, the previous Archbishop of Canterbury, which many of you will know I have a huge respect for, I think this sign might look something like this. It might be a sign with the words, 
Ignore God at your peril, written across it. Let me explain. On the cross, Jesus takes upon himself the very worst that humanity can do to itself. He takes all the hate, all the power games, all the might of the greatest army of the world, all the control freakery of the religious leaders. He takes it all. In doing so, he paints an enormous sign of warning across the sky of the universe. And it says this. This is what happens when you ignore God. When you refuse to listen to God. When you drive God out of your politics, out of your education systems, out of your homes and out of your society. You end up putting God outside your city. You exclude God from your decisions and from your lives. You cast him out and you let the very idea of God die alone and friendless outside the thin walls of your self-created cities. But what Jesus does with this death on the cross is magnificent. Having let the hatred and the, the indifference of human power overwhelm him to the very point of death, what does he do? He bursts forth out of his tomb, powerfully demonstrating for all time that love will always win over hate. True life, eternal life, will always overcome death. There is hope, despite the worst that humanity can do to itself. And Jesus says to humanity, come to me. All of you that are travailing, working, and are heavy laden by the world and its ways. And I will give you rest. Take my ways, my yoke, upon your shoulders. For my burden is light. So for me, the cross is a symbol of the worst that humanity can do. But also it's a sign of the hope we have in Christ. It stands for hope that better days are coming. It stands for hope that we can turn our swords into plowshares. It stands for hope that we can include God in our decisions, in our lives and in our society and in our politics. It shouts out that selfishness, consumerism, power, greed, hatred, racism and all the rest do not have to be the only way to live. That there is another way. The downward thrust of the cross from heaven into earth calls us to let all those human patterns die. And having sought forgiveness for our complicity in them, it calls us to rise again with Christ to life anew. Amen.